Well, it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk about this exciting topic today. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for putting on this, uh, uh, this meeting to help out patients. It's really wonderful. All right, well, I think we're supposed to jump right in then with that. And um, the uh, topic today, which I was assigned by the leaders of your meeting, immune therapy for prostate cancer. Immune therapy is an absolutely vast topic, very challenging to try and condense into 45 minutes. And we're gonna focus on the types of immune aspects of um, uh, immune, uh, immune therapies that are focused for prostate cancer. And uh, even that, we'll have to go over this very, very quickly. The, what we call cancer uh, is, a, um, is a condition of uncontrolled cell growth. It's very complicated because there are many different mutations in the normal cell that have to occur for it to become a cancerous cell. And this slide lists some of the necessary changes for cells to become immortal, for them to start spreading and metastasizing, for them to be able to land in a foreign part of the body and grow as a metastasis. So the point we're going to be focusing on is that these cells also have different mechanisms for um, avoiding our own immune systems from eradicating them. Your, your body relies on your immune system to keep early uh, cancers under control. And so some of the cancer cells develop uh, the ability to evade the immune system. What we call the immune system is it's difficult to characterize, but uh, most people are familiar. They've heard of lymph nodes, which are sometimes removed at the time of surgery. Uh, there's also the spleen, there's uh, the bone marrow, and uh, what we call the immune system is essentially very specialized cells, white cells, that circulate in the blood, in the lymph, and then uh, have certain characteristics that we're going to go into a little bit that describe how uh, these cells go after cancer cells. One of the things we're going to focus on in this uh, talk are a specific subtype of white cell called the antigen-presenting cells or the APCs. Uh, these are the cells that start the whole cascade going for trying to fight cancer. The T cells, which we're also going to talk about, are the uh, so-called so soldier cells of the immune system. But when we talk about the immune system, it's not just cells. Uh, we're surrounded by bacteria and viruses, and these, uh, these agents can, uh, if they get through the skin, can become um, very dangerous. So, so our skin, our mucous membranes, all these things are designed to protect us just as the immune system. And then if they get past those barriers, then we're relying on the cellular uh, components of the immune system to detect and then attack and eradicate them. The, this uh, picture here is, uh, shows uh, some T cells attacking a, a, a cancer cell and there's actual interactions between these cells. The, uh, uh, the T cells approach and, and uh, get next to these cells and inject things into them and, and uh, uh, create a, a methodology where the cells will actually die. And uh, there have been a number of different medicines that have been designed to stimulate this process, enhance it, and encourage it to be more effective and efficient. And that's part of what we're gonna go into today. There's been, uh, we've known about the immune system for, you know, ever since vaccines were developed, but th the uh, idea that the immune system uh, even exists, of course, is a relatively new idea of uh, maybe 100 years or so that it's uh, been around. And there have been doubts and naysayers uh, saying that, you know, we can't really affect the immune system and it's, it's, it's not uh, contributing that much. And I think part of the reason is that the immune system operates so efficiently and so silently the, we all in our intestines have, uh, you know, a lot of bacteria that are, uh, that are kept in check by your immune system on a constant basis, and it does this very efficiently and very quietly. So one thing that shows how the immune system uh, is uh, protecting us from cancers can be seen in people that go through immunosuppressive therapy when they undergo organ transplantation. So if a person gets a kidney transplant or a heart transplant, those... Uh, organs from a different person are detected as foreign, um, foreign organs and they have antigens that are not present in the original person. These antigens can be detected by the immune cells of the new host 
and then the immune system can start to attack it. And so that the, uh, the organ does not get rejected by the immune system, immunosuppressive drugs are given to, to uh, inhibit the activity of the immune system. So you can imagine then, if the immune system is being inhibited, that it would also inhibit other aspects of the immune system, and these could lead to people uh, getting cancers more frequently. So that's the hypothesis, and a number of studies have been done in people that have had transplants, demonstrating clearly that the incidence of other types of cancers showing up in immunosuppressed people from organ transplants, uh, that these uh, different cancers occur with a great uh, increased frequency. If you scroll down on the list here, you can see that the incidence of prostate cancer doubles in people that have had organ transplants. It's 15-fold higher for uh, uh, kidney cancer, is 15-fold higher in people that have had organ transplants, and so on. So this is simply to validate how important this very silent and efficient system working in the background is in keeping cancers away. Other evidence that shows that the immune system is really working on our behalf to protect us from cancers ha have been uh, demonstrated in studies where they look at uh, biopsies of cancer tumors and, and count how many immune cells are infiltrating into the, the, into the tumor itself. They've shown that people that have higher T cell counts infiltrating the tumor live longer than people who have lower counts. So there's a direct correlation to how well the, the immune cells, the T cells from the immune system, penetrate the tumor and how long people live. There is this ongoing balancing act between the cancer cells trying to get away from the immune system or hide and the immune, self, the immune system itself uh, being stimulated and uh, enhanced and strengthened to fight the cancer. And uh, this, the immune system then uh, accomplishes the eradication or the suppression of the cancer with varying success. Uh, and the, um, this dynamic process can be sum, uh, summarized as uh, the three potential outcomes from the immune system are the actual elimination of the cancer cells, an equilibrium stage where the immune system inhibits further cancer progression. It doesn't eradicate the cancer, but stops or slows its growth. And then an escape phenomena where the cancer just is too much and the immune system is unable to control it. As we talk about the different ways that this works, we're, we're looking at how, um, uh, how in different scenarios the immune system can accomplish uh, either suppression of the cancer growth or even eradication of the cancer cells. So this is an example of eliminating the cancer. The T cells approximate with the cancer cells and then kill them off. And then once they die, the normal uh, tissues grow back and the cancer is completely eliminated. The cancer in this uh, diagram is illustrated by the brown cells. So normal cellular structure is restored. An equilibrium stage is uh, accomplished when the immune cells are approximated to the cancer and the cancer does not uh, disappear, but neither does it progress or grow into a larger tumor. And then if we have a, um, a further example of when the immune system is not able to control the cancer, we see that despite the immune system engaging with the cancer cells, unfortunately, the tumor keeps growing. So let's go into some definitions. This is our most technical slide in the, um, in the talk today. And as we go through and, and look at these different components of the immune system, we'll also be able to get a sense how some of the common medicines that are used to treat prostate cancer are functioning to enhance the immune system. The T cells we've already mentioned, these are the, the soldier cells or the activated lymphocytes that seek out and uh, approximate with the cancer cells and then, um, and then uh, you know, attack the cells and kill them or suppress them. The antigen presenting cells or the APCs, these are the cells that detect abnormal antigens and then subsequently activate the T cells. And uh, the uh, antigens, these are the molecules that are not present in our body but can be detected as strangers. And uh, these protein molecules are what are, are detected so that the immune system uh, swings into action. 
Antibodies are um, specialized proteins that stick to these antigens. And they have two components, a sticky side that sticks to the antigen and a, and a protein side that sort of waves like a flag so that uh, the immune system can detect them and realize that they're sticking to an antigen, a foreign antigen, and that this cell needs to be attacked. Cytokines are special hormones that are uh, secreted by immune cells that stimulate the overall immune response. So, as you can see in green, we've listed some medicines, which we're going to circle back to as we go through this talk, that are used in the treatment of prostate cancer, either on or off-label. Keytruda, Provenge, uh, Leukine, and, um, and then a, a process we call antigen spreader, the abscopal effect, which we'll go into in more detail. I threw in, uh, I know the next talk is going to be about the PSMA uh, PET scans and lutetium-177, and this is such a big breakthrough that it deserves a talk of its own. Uh, but it's interesting to note that this whole technology <laughs> is built on the fact that you can synthesize antibodies that will stick to foreign proteins or even uh, nat natural proteins on the surface of cancer cells. Uh, the protein that we're specifically talking about is PSMA. And so an antibody that sticks to PSMA, which occurs on prostate cancer cells, is able to then flag down the immune system, or it can also drag a, a, a radioactive molecule that can be either scanned, or if it's a powerful radioactive molecule, that can actually radiate the cancer. So it's not really an immune therapy like the other four green things that are listed on this page, Keytruda, Provenge, and the antigen spread in leukine, but it is uh, a, a giant breakthrough, and uh, you're going to have an extensive talk on the subject uh, following mine. In this cartoon, we're going to illustrate the process. The little round uh, balls are, are the foreign antigens. The, round, the large round APC, that's the antigen-presenting cell. And once it recognizes a foreign antigen, it activates, as is illustrated, and uh, starts to... Uh, to um, uh, grow and change, and then it seeks out and uh, T cells, which it then activates. So it's a two-step process where the uh, antigen-presenting cell uh, is transformed into an active form and then starts activating the T cells, which can then replicate and grow and go on to uh, attack cancer cells. So it's the activation of the antigen presenting cell that starts the whole cascade process. And this has been demonstrated. This is a um, scanning electron micrograph showing T cells attacking the purple cancer cell and, uh, and the, uh, the dynamic process of how these cells approximate and eliminate the cancer cells. So this whole um, uh, vaccine uh, and immune world, as I mentioned before, has only been around for about 100 years. Uh, some of the early uh, things that were uh, attempted were uh, actually rather ridiculous and quite ineffective. But uh, about 30, 40 years ago, they did discover that a vaccine that was used against tuberculosis called BCG also had a nonspecific stimulatory effect on, um, on the immune system. And this is actually used to this day to uh, treat low-grade uh, bladder cancers. Uh, in, um, with it, this is instilled into the bladder itself uh, and along the bladder wall where the bladder cancer is. This uh, BCG stimulates an immune reaction and keeps the bladder cancer in control. This process has been very slow and it's been with fits and starts. Uh, and it, uh, But there were some cytokines or hormones w approved, one of which is uh, we're talking about today called leukine. And uh, the leukine was originally approved as granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, the GMCSF, or leukine is the trade name. It's an injection that was originally approved to boost the white blood cell counts in people getting chemotherapy. And the, um, it's quite, very effective for that. And chemotherapy historically has been given to um, uh, to a dosage that pushes the immune system temporarily right to the brink. And one of the risks of chemotherapy has been infections because of the transient suppression of the immune system. When leukine and, and a competitor to this called Neupogen were FDA approved, this really changed uh, the uh, ease with which we can give chemotherapy. It was very useful for that purpose. Uh, 
Uh, but some people have taken this same medicine, GMCSF or leukine, and since it stimulates the immune system, the hypothesis maybe it can also stimulate the immune system to attack cancer cells directly. And while leukine has never been FDA approved to treat prostate cancer, it has been looked at in several studies. Eric Small up at uh, UCSF uh, did a study in, um, I think, 40 or 50 patients who um, had rising PSAs after surgery. And uh, this is kind of an attractive space because back when they were doing these studies, this is all 15, 20 years ago, the only other alternative was Lupron. And Lupron uh, blocks all the testosterone out and uh, therefore is, uh, is unattractive for that reason, even though it's very effective. So he found in injecting leukine, uh, subcutaneous injection like an insulin shot uh, in the skin every two weeks, and then two weeks off and two weeks on and two weeks off, that about 20% of the men that had rising PSAs after, sh after surgery maintained stable low PSA levels for up to five years. And uh, they didn't test beyond five years. But I've also had patients who've uh, been on this medication for extended periods of time with stable PSAs. It seems to be an effective medicine when there's a relatively small amount of cancer, and this is sort of a recurrent theme in the, in the uh, immune world, which we'll circle back to. Uh, but it uh, is generally well tolerated, although stimulation of the immune system sometimes can cause some joint aches and body aches, sort of like if you have a, um, a virus or something like that. For the most part, uh, people don't complain much about the side effects associated with leukine. Uh, and uh, it, it clearly has activity, but it's never been FDA approved. So the biggest problem with leukine now in 2021 is, first, it, it's only going to be for people with relatively small amounts of, of cancer, and you're not going to use it in the newly diagnosed because we've got a lot of other better options. But for someone that's trying to sidestep the use of um, Lupron uh, in, in the relapse setting, it could be an attractive option. So the... Um, more recent develops, de developments are very exciting because there's a whole uh, mechanism, and we'll illustrate this more fully in a moment, but the, um, to keep your immune system in check. Immune systems that are um, running out of control, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, uh, can, can really wreak havoc. And uh, so when, you, um, uh, when the body creates an immune reaction, it also creates different methods to slow the immune reaction down so it doesn't burn out of control like a fire, but accomplishes what it needs and then regresses back to its uh, uh, quiescent state. So big breakthrough when they discovered that, um, that there are ways that we can slow down this checkpoint process or these, these, these braking systems. So if, if you think about it, if you take the brakes off the immune system, that the overall immune activity is going to be enhanced. And if we're fighting cancer, the risks of an overactive immune system may be less dangerous than the cancer itself and certainly justified. So uh, your VOI is, is, uh, was the first uh, checkpoint inhibitor approved about 10 years ago. And then a um, cellular immunotherapy, which we'll go into in a little more detail, um, was also approved in 2010. So these are the four uh, types of immune treatment that I think of when uh, treating prostate cancer patients. Uh, we mentioned Yervoy and Provenge already. Uh, Keytruda is a medicine uh, similar to Yervoy that also blocks uh, checkpoints that regulate and reduce T cell activation. Um, leukine we've talked about. And then another phenomenon uh, called antigen spread sometimes is elicited in uh, men with metastatic prostate cancer by giving spot radiation to tumors. Antigen spread uh, we'll go into in more detail as well, but this idea that you can, uh, that when you kill off a few cancer cells, that you are able then subsequently to create more antigens that the immune system can detect is, has been shown in some cases to cause regression of tumors in other parts of the body that, are not, that aren't even radiated. So this is how the checkpoint inhibitors work in, an, uh, in a diagram uh, format. The, um, we, you see the APC, activated APC cell at the top of the um, image there, activating the T cells, which are then um, going after the tumor cell on the far right. And then the, the interaction between the surfaces of the T cell and the APC is magnified, and you can see where Yervoy, which is signified by this, the little yellow Y-shaped uh, 
things that are blocking the CTLA-4 antigen. CTLA-4 is, uh, if it's activated, if those little red uh, baseball bats stick into the uh, CTLA-4 um, uh, active site there, then that's going to slow down the process of uh, T-cell activation. So what your void does is it just gets in the way of that slowing down process. And that is uh, in the step between APC, APC cells and T cells. Keytruda has a similar mechanism of action, except that it's blocking a different receptor that is uh, uh, on the presence on the surface of T cells, and uh, and it uh, blocks out uh, or it it blocks out the tumor cells from being able to uh, connect with the PD1 um, receptor. And if it uh, if they do connect with the PD1 receptor, then that's going to tell the T cell to go away. So if you keep that process blocked, then the T cells will continue to do their business, attack and kill the tumor cells. So uh, Keytruda and Yervoy have been approved for multiple um, different cancer types. Uh, Keytruda is in phase three trials for prostate cancer. We've treated over 100 patients on a compassionate use basis, and it has activity, again, mostly in the androgen-independent patients or androgen-sensitive patients with relatively small amounts of prostate cancer. Yervoy, on the other hand, uh, was tested in, a, in two huge phase three trials that were headed up by our, uh, one of our favorite speakers at the PCRI, Dr. Eugene Kwan. And in uh, the first trial, Yervoy was studied with, um, in very advanced prostate cancer, and it was studied in combination with spot radiation to a metastatic site to induce an abscopal effect. So it was actually a combination treatment of Yervoy and, uh, and spot radiation. And that clinical trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, if I recall correctly, um, was, um, uh, came this close, literally a half a percentage point away from um, FDA approval. It was, uh, if they'd had just one or two more patient responses, it would be a standard treatment that we'd be using to this day in prostate cancer. But because of the way the laws are set up, uh, that particular trial did not qualify. So Bristol Myers, who makes your void, decided that this um, uh, is certainly an active agent and it should be repeated in earlier stage patients because the general belief is that immune th therapies are going to work better against less advanced cancers. And such a trial was initiated, but unfortunately, they failed to incorporate the spot radiation component of the first trial. And it also did not reach statistical significance. So. So your boy is not FDA approved for prostate cancer, but it came so close to getting approved, and there's certainly de de demonstrable activity for this agent. Unfortunately, without FDA approval, it's expensive and difficult to access uh, as the insurance companies are unwilling to pay for it. Keytruda, on the other hand, is still in the development process, and the um, uh, phase three trials have yet to be completed. As I mentioned before, we've had uh, experience with this medicine in prostate cancer patients, and it seems that about half of the patients that we administer this medicine to have a, um, a meaningful either slowing in the rate of their PSA rise or sometimes regression of their PSA. Uh, there's a doctor at UCLA, Dr. Joanne Wheathouse, who has developed an assay to detect which patients are genetically susceptible to side effects from Keytruda. And, uh, they can, she can predict in advance, based on a mouse swab or a blood test, whether a, a patient who gets Keytruda is likely to have side effects. So with that use, uh, this medicine, which is infused every three weeks, um, can be given really quite safely. Uh, when patients do have side effects from Keytruda or Yervoy, they can be rather dramatic and serious. The immune system, when it's out of control, can be a very, very daunting prospect. So uh, now moving on to how Provenge works. So uh, the idea of Provenge is that the um, uh, activated APC cells, again, stimulate the T cells, which then go and attack the cancer. So how do these APC cells get activated? Well, what happens is in the process of Provenge treatment, men uh, go through a um, uh, it's like a dialysis process, leukapheresis, where APC, non-activated APC cells, are, are taken out of the bloodstream and then transported to a facility either, in, I believe, in Atlanta and Seal Beach, California, where they are processed with leukine 
and, and put in a vat with leukine and with a specific antigen that's very common in prostate cancer called prostatic acid phosphatase. So this mixture uh, uh, is then uh, swirled around and the APC cells detect PAP as a foreign antigen and they become activated and then they are replicated partly because of the leukine that they're receiving and then this uh, new slurry of cells is reinfused into the same patient. So the patient that gets the infusion, he's getting infused with cells that came from his own body. This process is repeated cyclically for every two weeks for a total of three treatments, and then uh, the treatment is finished. So uh, Provenge has been uh, demonstrated to uh, prolong life in people even with very advanced cancers, uh, advanced prostate cancer, but it, uh, the degree of prolongation in people that have you know, PSAs in the hundreds or something like that is not that long, a few months, at least on average. Some people certainly longer, others don't even get any benefit. But the impact can be much more substantial if people are treated at an earlier stage. And this is where Provenge fits, is in people who have been on Lupron for some period of time because of a cancer relapse, and then their PSA starts rising. These are the individuals that need to go and get one of these new PSMA PET scans, find the spot, consider radiating the spot, of course, and then at that juncture also be administered Provenge. This is when uh, Provenge is likely to work best. And since it has very few, if any, side effects, it's a very natural thing to use at that stage. So I want to just elaborate a little bit more of this abscopal effect. It can be from radiation. It actually can be from any type of cancer treatment that kills cancer cells. Not from surgery. Surgery removes the antigens. But anything that kills the cancer cells in sight, cryotherapy, HIFU, radiation, will create new antigens that your immune system can detect and then uh, create a stronger immune response. So when the radiation, as illustrated on the far uh, left, is administered to the prostate area or to a tumor, say, or a lymph node in the pelvis, as is being demonstrated in this picture, um, that, that kills cancer cells. And those cancer cells then will release the new antigens, which then can be detected by the APC cell and then the APC cell can activate new T cells that are going after different antigens than the original antigens that they may, may or may not have detected. And uh, this is called the um, uh, process of antigen spreading. And this is the idea that has been uh, observed in patients that have undergone spot radiation, say, to a single site, uh, a bone metastasis or a lymph node, and on subsequent scanning, without any other uh, cancer therapy, have, been, have demonstrated regression in tumors in other parts of the body. So the just killing one tumor with radiation then creates an immune reaction that can uh, allow the immune system to go on and kill cancer in other parts of the body. It doesn't certainly happen in every patient, but it, um, uh, when it happens, it's, a, it's an effective and real effect, and it may be better uh, if these things are used in combination. And this is what we saw in the uh, clinical trial where Yervoy came, came that close to FDA approval is that they used both the spot radiation plus the Yervoy, and they came very, very close to sh uh, getting statistical significance in their large phase three trial. So this rather complex graph illustrates the idea of uh, what immune system may be uh, accomplishing. And uh, this illustration I think is important because Historically, when we talk about treating something with hormone therapy or chemotherapy, we show efficacy by seeing a sharp, uh, perhaps a 50% decline in PSA. And that um, is not a common uh, reaction to immune therapy. In immune therapy, uh, it seems that, uh, especially in patients that have more advanced cancers, that it's more likely that what's happening is that it's slowing the cancer's progression rather than causing a sharp uh, regression or disappearance of cancer cells. But that's not to say that's disadvantageous because patients with these growing tumors uh, are on a, on a road to cancer mortality at some point. And this is illustrated in this graph here. If you look at the far left, you can see the lines uh, sharply angled upwards. And then if a patient were to receive no treatment whatsoever, he would be projected to die at some specific time point in the future. But if administered an effective immune therapy, you could see how if the rate of growth can be slowed, that this will extend survival. 
and that possibly with combination immune therapies, you could get regression or further slowing and even longer survival. So the idea that PSA must decline to demonstrate efficacy is a specious argument when we're talking about immune therapy. And it's uh, kind of sad when sometimes even sophisticated uh, physicians or naysayers, uh, I don't know how they can look fat past the fact that double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials have been done with, these, with uh, Provence, for example, showing better survival in the treated patients compared to the ones that received placebo alone. You can also see, using the same idea, that if cancer treatment is initiated when there's less cancer to control, that you're going to get a greater impact in survival prolongation. And so this is illustrated by uh, patient A, who, uh, who without treatment, you can see the dotted line extending up to his projected time of death, but who with treatment at an earlier stage is going to uh, change the rate of growth at an earlier stage and, uh, and thus improve survival compared to a patient who gets treated at a later stage and who uh, will not have as big an improvement in survival. So in summary, uh, some of the concepts that we wanted to transmit to you today are that there's no doubt that the immune system is uh, going to be the wave of the future. We already have effective uh, useful, tolerable medicines, and they do need to be used selectively at, at, in certain subtypes of prostate cancer. It's not for everybody. It's not for early stage prostate cancer. In early stage patients, we have other uh, uh, feasible options. Immune therapies, if they cause side effects, the side effects like the uh, immune uh, benefits can be very long lasting. So there's a, there's a risk benefit ratio that is always being weighed when someone is put on an immune therapy. But it's, there's no doubt that the immunotherapies do boost the immune system and that by boosting the immune system, you can prolong survival. Uh, this has been demonstrated with, with several different approaches as we have gone over. The, um, just to reiterate, the rates of change of PSA are not gonna be the same when you're evaluating how effective an immune treatment is. And the um, idea of using treatment in combination or earlier in the course of, uh, of patients' uh, treatment uh, with, for prostate cancer is, uh, is likely to accrue bigger benefits than waiting to the last minute. So thank you very much. Here's uh, uh, just a quick uh, image of the books that we have out. The one on the left is a book uh, about the prostate cancer culture in general. The one on the right is sort of a how-to manual on how to manage the five different stages of prostate cancer. And thank you so much for having me.